the old world is ending, and we have the opportunity to rethink everything. This is a show about the structural problems in our world and the real solutions that we have today to transition from an apocalyptic storm of war, scarcity, and ecological collapse into a collaborative and sustainable futuristic society that serves all life. You may think it's an impossible dream, but the alternative is an inevitable nightmare. We're your hosts, Zachary Marlowe, Matt Holton, and Amanda Smith. And together, when we can move past this economic absurdity to come together and actualize our collective potential to create something completely new, we are Moneyless Society. Climate crisis is upon us. Time is running out. There's no need for fear-mongering because these are facts. By measuring wealth in terms of counting dollars instead of accounting resources, the damage to our environment adds up, thus mankind continues to march naively towards the edge of extinction, with the world as we know it in tow. Our oceans and seas, prairies and deserts, our forests, and even the steadfast mountains are heaving and choking on the aftermath of industrialized society's age-old narrative which has infamously entangled mankind in foreboding fairy tales about infinite growth and acquisition. Our guests today are activists, Flower Garden, and the pessimistic environmentalists. They're here to enlighten us on the many layers of climate change. Join us, your hosts, Marlo, Matthew, and myself, Amanda, as we discuss the anthropocentric roots of systemic issues that are running out the clock in the plight to divert Earth and all of its inhabitants from certain demise. This is, I think, literally the most important conversation we could be having right now. I mean, not just us in this room on this show, but the human race having this conversation, engaging with the most important issue of our lives, of our times, climate change, which is an enormous term, an enormous word that means something different to everybody. But it's the inarguable reality of our times that our climate is changed to the point almost of no return. We as a society as an industrial machine have destroyed and devastated the ecology of this planet to the point where it will it is almost irrevocably changed and we are currently at this moment of choice we as a species are at a pass fail moment for uh, whether or not life is going to continue in the next hundred years or you know at all on this planet so Today, I've assembled a, what I feel is a crack team of activists that I met working with Extinction Rebellion in uh, Los Angeles. I remember vividly the first time I, we were all together, it, we came together and blocked an intersection. I think it was Sunset Boulevard by the Chase Bank with a boat. We moved a boat in, in the middle of this super busy intersection at 6 a.m. and blocked traffic. And I just, I remember the the first time I saw Alan, I actually have a, a, a shot of this in a video I made about it. He's wearing this leather jacket covered in flowers and bees and pollinators with this just staring, you know, dashingly into the sun like this revolutionary warrior. And I remember Flower and her spirit of just defiant and powerful, assured strength, just standing in, in, in her aviators on the steps of that bank, just holding her fist in the air, just like a true warrior for, for our climate, for our environment. So I kind of want to introduce the two of them, let them uh, say who they are, and then let's dive into this issue. I was born in New York City, grew up here in Hawaii. I'm a surfer. I love the ocean, and I cannot think of the ocean being dead. I just can't. And I can't think of a planet where my grandchildren will not be able to live. I am here because I don't want in... 10, 20 years from now for my grandchildren to look at me and go, Flower, why didn't you do something about this? And that's why I'm here doing something about it. For me, I grew up in San Diego and my entire life growing up, I was going to the San Diego Zoo. And back then it was known as the Wild Animal Park. And for as long as I can remember, my entire life has just been um, an unfathomably deep passion for wildlife and uh, wanting to work with them. As time has gone on, I've realized that um, the best way to save uh, that life and to appreciate it is to, uh, is, is to work towards conservation. So as much as I would love to work with animals, that's what my degree is in, that's what I've done for my entire life, um, it has meandered and branched off in many different ways. So even though I obtained my degree in biology, I did research in uh, biology with um, endangered species, um, with wildfires, 
and I was a wildlife biologist for some time. I have also um, held elected office. I have also worked in policy, and I've even done filmmaking regarding climate change. Um, all of these things have been attempts to try and better myself in the debate regarding climate change. Um, and eventually it led me to um, being called to be an activist in 2015. It's a been a long meandering thing, but it's become more cogent as time has gone on. But now I'm here and able to finally do something. I think uh, overall, what I'd like to get into in this episode is what is the reality of climate change? What does that actually mean to all of us? What does that mean for us as a species? Basically, the only real solution to climate change is to completely overhaul our system. We can't reform it. We can't make these little tweaks and changes. We can't get people to stop using straws and all that stuff. We need to do all those little things. We need reform. We need change in all areas of our life. But truly, climate change represents the most total a threat to human life that we have ever experienced and nothing short of a total systemic overhaul, a, a completely from the ground up change of the ways that we do business, the ways that we interact with our with each other and our in our world it needs to completely be changed from the ground up. And I think the overarching economic system of capitalism, of endless growth, of infinite expansion, of uh, trade and markets, all of these things are the driving forces of, ca of the climate crisis, and nothing short of changing those things is going to fix it. So I I'd actually like to, uh, to turn it to Alan and ask you a very simple question. Uh, what is climate change? I want you to uncork the Molotov cocktail on this one. <laughs> okay, in, in order to do that, I need to elaborate as to what climate change is. So there's a difference between climate change and global warming. Global warming is when the planet simply warms because of fossil fuels. Even more broadly speaking, it is because of an increase in greenhouse gases. Um, whether or not it comes from fossil fuels, that's up to us, literally. When it comes to climate change itself, climate change is when, because of that atmospheric change, because of the planet getting warmer, there are different fluctuations in the localized weather patterns over a long period of time. That's essentially what climate is. It is the trend in weather over a long period of time. If it snows outside, there's not evidence of no climate change. So it has to be over a long period of time. The climate changes themselves can be very small, and they can even be rather large. When it comes to ecology itself, um, there's the study of small micro systems, and then there are larger systems known as biomes. Together, those biomes work together to create the biosphere. Um, there are plenty of um, interconnected loops when it comes to biomes, and they feed off of each other. They rely on one another, so you can experience a sort of trophic cascade, if you will. Once one bastion, once one vanguard falls, the other will follow in suit, because nature and life is a very resilient but very delicate thing. So when it comes to the runaway element of climate change, it is the thing that leads to that trophic cascade. It's when, it, because too often people think of it being um, kind of like a score, like a scoreboard, you know, where it'll be like one, zero, two, zero, two, one, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, it's more like a scale, okay? Like an old fashioned scale. If you take a weight off of one side, you don't just get rid of it, you put it onto the other side. So instead of it going from 50-50 to 51-50, it instead goes 51-49. So then once it starts adding up, the runaway happens that much quicker. If we lose one form of carbon sequestration, such as a forest, such as a coral reef, then all of the carbon that was inside that forest is now back up in the atmosphere, and there are fewer things to sequester that carbon. So what we're looking at is essentially, over time, things pile on and pile on, and the fight becomes increasingly insurmountable. And so that's why the, the agency has increased. We've become more dire in our circumstances because there are now things like peat forests, like rainforests, like coral reefs that are dying off and releasing their carbon. And in turn, the things that kill those forests and the things that those forests and coral reefs and algae uh, segments are required to do, um, it exacerbates other issues. So it increases the frequency of extreme weather events and it increases the migration and growth of other organisms um, that are otherwise harmful to us. So for instance, pine beetles are something that naturally are here 
Uh, their life cycle occurs when they burrow inside trees, but nature keeps them in check. And it does that by having a winter cooldown, and it kills those pine beetles. But now, with an increase in global temperatures, those pine beetles are not going through that life cycle phase, and therefore they do not die. They continue to kill the forests. So those forests that would naturally sequester carbon in that off-season are now incapable of doing that, and they're being killed twice as fast. That is just one of many examples of the runaway climate change. I hope that was enough to answer that question as thoroughly and as coherently as possible and synthesize that. Yeah, and I have a question for you too. You used a word, uh, a phrase called trophic cascades. Can you give a few more examples and, and elaborate on that term a little bit more? Because I think a lot of people listening aren't really going to be sure exactly what that means. Of, of course, absolutely. Trophic cascades are usually in reference to organisms. So for instance, it would be in... Uh, in your biology class, or even perhaps before that, you were probably taught about things like food uh, chains and food webs. How uh, There are the autotrophs, the organisms that create their own food, um, and then there are the animals that eat those um, organisms, and so on and so forth. And then to go further in depth, there are things that are called keystone species. They are the foundation of um, the ecosystem surrounding them. A great example would be the acacia tree and the giraffe in the, the savannas of Africa. They're really awesome. They're like the Tom Hanks of the savannah, right? A lot of people love giraffes. Um, they're not just cool. Um, they're also really, really important. And so if you were to get rid of the giraffe, for instance, it would not exist and eat from the acacia tree, pollinate other acacia trees, and germinate the acacia tree. The acacia tree provides food and shelter for many other animals. And those animals provide food for other animals. So by simply getting rid of the giraffe, you get rid of the acacia, you get rid of the birds that live in the acacia, you get rid of the birds that feed on those birds that live in the acacia, you get rid of the animals that mate in the shade of the acacia tree or that put their babies in the shade of the acacia tree and those animals that are eaten by them and so on and so forth. That's what trophic cascade is. A really simplified version of that would be the classic seesaw. So if you were to look at a forest and you have rabbits and wolves, uh, here comes the scale again. If you have more wolves, those wolves need to eat. So if there's lots of wolves eating, the number of rabbits goes down. If there's fewer rabbits to eat, then the wolves starve. And so then they start to go down. With fewer wolves hunting them, then the rabbits come back in numbers. With the increase in rabbits, then the wolves are able to feed and reproduce. And so it's this back and forth kind of thing. But then with Trophic Cascade, it would be remove the wolves. Suddenly you have a growth that is unchecked of rabbits. And so that's why it's very important that we keep not just our predators, but then also then imagine if you were to get rid of the rabbits. You would, then the wolves would move on to other things, um, whether they hunt or they would move on to other places. And so that's often what we're seeing in these continental United States. Yeah, and that's funny that you say that. I, I've seen a video before um, uh, how wolves change rivers. I think it was um, Sustainable Human put that video out. Really, really amazing video. I think it's on YouTube or something. Just Google how wolves change rivers. And it was really interesting. Pro another example of a trophic cascade, like you're talking about how, how it affects the food chain all the way down to even the species that grow along the riverbanks and uh, help you know maintain the sides of the rivers and the grasslands that surround rivers and things like that and how all that is related just to wolves literally being in the the area um that's really interesting thanks for sharing that i mean the problem with all of that is that and and you know it's like conservatives will make these dumbass arguments about like forest fires it's like oh the, like we can't log it because of the spotted toad or whatever where they, they don't realize at all that one species going extinct completely affects the whole life cycle it affects the whole forest it affects every single creature in the forest and it's just like i just urge anybody listening go through the forest and and look at how connected life is you know like there's this woodpecker that that lives in uh this part of indiana that that i that i'm living in right now or passing through right now and uh, it's called the pileated woodpecker and it bores these big holes in trees and it, it and it does that so that it can eat uh bugs inside of them but this this woodpecker actually creates habitats for multiple other species so it's like every single creature in the forest is dependent on every single other creature and humans have this attitude that it's like oh well you know a few species can die newsflash Something like 70% of, of species on Earth have died, have gone extinct in the past 30 years. That is the effect that we have had on, the, on our environment. Even just recently, even just in the last few decades, that is the ever-accelerating effect that we have on our environment. That 
the, these these small things, these small destabilizing elements, like Alan was talking about brilliantly, they all add up. They all accelerate, and 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 every single small thing that falls off, it it it's a snowball effect. It's an it's a melting snowball effect that it, it's <laughs> it's it's running away in this in this uh, way that everything is is collapsing all at once. I mean, it's like I read that the uh, the Amazon rainforest through those fires last year, they they put they uh, put out more carbon into the atmosphere than they sequestered. So the effect that we're having on our environment is absolutely monumental. We're melting permafrost. I mean, there, there's, there's so many uh, cascading effects of it, but the, 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 the overarching problem is that the whole ecology is collapsing. Pro probably one of the most important things to accentuate in that entire thing is that once you start looking into it, you really realize how many things have fallen and then how they lead into each other. I personally hate, um, both as an environmentalist and as a biologist in general, um, the, I, the the sentiment that people have where the only reason to regard the sanctity of a life form in the form of another um, species is its worth to us, like whether or not it can be of uh, use to us. Um, and so that's why I, I've always hated those, those articles of like, oh, climate change is affecting coffee or, you know, like, don't care about climate change, you will now because it's coming for your wine or for your avocados or whatever. I always hate that because it's it's the same kind of thing that we hear about a lot in um, in breeding conservation, where things like pandas get a lot of funding because they're cute, but the other animals that are way more important are getting no funding because they're not cute. Um, and so it's it's a lot of this whole um, thinking. It's this defund um, pandas. <laughs> well, like, but 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 it's 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 egocentric. It's anthropocentric to think that they're here for us when humans in their current form have only been here for two hundred thousand years. Everything that is here ecologically is here for a reason. It's a it's a three point eight billion year story. Evolution by natural selection led those things to this place and this time for a reason. And it's because they're meant to be here. If they were meant to not be here, then nature would have gotten rid of them. So the fact that we are getting rid of them is just insane. So what you're saying, Alan, and what you're saying, Marlo, what I gather from all of that, um, going down my, my always anthropological uh, rabbit hole, is um, the powerful mechanism of out of sight, out of mind. Uh, you were saying about how um, pandas are more funded than species that we don't see, we're not shown, we're not even taught about. And to me, that just exemplifies, um, again, the root of the issue here, the for-profit system. You know, if things aren't cute, then they're not going to make money. You know, as they say, sex sales, pill sales, cosmetic sale. Same goes for the uh, animal kingdom and uh, ecology and um, the greenwashing of corporations. I just wanted to point that out real quick before we move on. Um, for all intents and purposes, it is worth mentioning that part of the reason why pandas, uh, their conservation is nigh a lost cause is because of, in fact, quite not the fact that they have sex. They, <laughs> if, if, the, if the sex sells sentiment carried over into that, we would not be funding pandas because they are the animals that reproduce the least. They're almost determined to go extinct. <laughs> and that there, are no, there are no uh, panda videos on Pornhub. Uh, Flower, yeah. I want to kind of pivot. I want to pivot to you here um, to kind of uh, bank off of what Amanda was talking about to talk about something that we talked about on the phone uh, when I approached you for this. That the roots of climate change are in capitalism and colonialism. Capitalism would not have survived without colonialism. Capitalism needed colonialism for labor to produce funds and goods to go back to the aristocracies that pushed colonizing the rest of the world. But it's it's the uh, the this, the disorder that we see nature as something to exploit really is a direct result of the condition in humans that they feel like they need to exploit each other. That there's always going to be somebody that they need to enslave, that they need to exploit, that they need to take advantage of. Due to natural resources when England came to, to the Americas, the what is now called the Americas, they had already used all of the resources, not all, but they had polluted the rivers, cut down a lot of the trees, and they were out of resources. When Christopher Columbus came to the Americas, Ferdinand and Queen Isabella funded his route to come here because the Moors had cut off their routes to go to the east, where they were 
getting their resources from, and they needed to find another route to find their resources. And this is, this is, it didn't start here in the Americas. It started long before the Americas. It started in Africa with Greece and in, in, in Northern Africa and Egypt, Mesopotamia, and what is now called the Middle East and Eastern Europe. Actually, the first slaves were the Slavs of Eastern Europe. The aristocracy used Eastern Europe as a template to basically colonize the rest of the planet. When you have a hierarchy that is going to use the rest of the people on the planet and their resources where they live, because if you think about England, it's finite. It's, a, it's an island. I've lived on islands. Our planet is finite, but islands are extremely finite with resources. Once the population becomes large, I lived on Maui since 1979, and I don't live there anymore because their resources are finite. There's not enough water there to really sustain the people, the amount of people that live there. All the food is shipped in, and that's on most of the islands in the Caribbean and a lot of the islands in the South Pacific, and they've all been colonized. I think you make a great point in uh, going that far back. It pretty much highlights how resource acquisition has always been the propeller of conquest and war. And of course, war plays into climate change as well. And that's something I hope that we'll touch on uh, in this conversation, and particularly how the uh, oil hoarding artificial hierarchy of the society played a role in, in this resource acquisition, which is my word for war. Um, and, and how that factors into to climate change and the uh, like the oil fields of California, um, the Bush administration or dynasty rather that uh, you know sparked war in the Middle East. What are your thoughts on that? Well, the Middle East, if you think about it, it's, it's completely unsustainable. It's not sustainable at all at any means. The only reason they have the amount of wealth that they have is only because of the oil. And then also California is the, specifically Los Angeles, California, is the largest urban oil field in the United States. People are not aware of the amount of oil that comes out of California, Texas. Basically, the United States could sustain itself with the oil that is here but they don't want to because they're using it as reserves between Canada, Alaska, California, Texas. They don't want to use that. They'd rather get oil from the Middle East, bring it here and use that and use what we have here in the States as reserves. And none of it is actually sustainable because at the end of the day, we're killing ourselves with carbon emissions. We're, we're using more carbon emissions to bring oil from the Middle East here to then burn here. I mean, it, we're just not doing anything that is sustainable at all. To, to speak to the, uh, the, the oil reserves that the United States has, actually, uh, Obama, one of Obama's big contributions, one of the big things he did as president was to uh, make America energy independent, quote. So Obama massively ramped up our oil use to make America oil independent. And a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people think like, oh, Obama, yeah, he, he, was, he did things with the EPA. He tried to affect climate change. Absolutely the fuck he did not. He did not help with climate change. He, he escalated things as much as anybody. And oil is a control mechanism. I mean, Ven the reason Venezuela is such a hot point, the reason Venezuela is you know, uh, one of the countries that the United States has a big crosshair on is because they have the largest oil reserves in the world. And the United States has to absolutely make sure that they can't access those resources so to make their people free from their supply chains. So it, it's, it's, it's this deadly addictive cycle of keeping people hooked, both, both keeping people hooked on the product, their product, and keeping people from actually being able to, to use their own resources. To pick up on a point you said earlier about uh, Rome being one of the uh, original sort of destabilizing ecological disasters is that the, the Sahara region actually was once and a lot of a lot of like northern africa was once 
you know, a forest. It was lush forests and it was logged and stripped and raised and completely transformed, desertified by empire, by the Roman Empire. And another another fact that really crystallizes the colonization uh, connection to climate change is that uh, when the Europeans came to Turtle Island, the Americas, they massacred so many of the indigenous people, so many of the people that lived there that were stewards of that land, they created a small ice age. And that is the directness of the effect that people have on this environment and, and the, the directly destabilizing effect of massacring indigenous peoples, the peoples who have maintained the earth and stewarded it and, and understood this connection and furthered that. And they were wiped out because of that, because they, because they, I th feel like there's, there's this inherent respect for life. And, and I think any, any behavior, any drive to uh, dehumanize or cut yourself off from feeling the, the validity of any form of life is going to make you more likely to be violent toward any other form of life. Can, can I ask a, a direct question? Um, do you think that they inherently knew that they were doing that? Because a part of me feels like they didn't know, but over time we could observe our behaviors and realize, are we creating this again? I had this, I had this thought the other day, looking at the slag heap of the wasted suburbs of America, just bathed in concrete, just orange traffic cones everywhere for no reason, just McDonald's is in a food desert. It just makes no sense. And it really got me thinking, no one thought about the long-term repercussions of, of anything in this entire history of this nation. With, with the whole westward expansion, it was all piecemeal. It was all, okay, we're going to grab this, and then we're going to grab that. We're going to take this, then we're going to take that. We're going to do this, and then we're going to take that. There was no real vision other than a vision of an expanse of colonization, an expanse of land theft, an expanse of just general domination. There was not, thought was not put into this. You know, the, the, uh, the epitome of, of uh, I feel like, the, in, in, the intuitive indigenous wisdom is, you know, the land doesn't belong to you. It belongs to your ancestors, you know, seven generations in the future. And that the, the, the effect that Western colonization had on this land is absolutely to the, to the opposite. Like, we, we, we've known that there's, you know, there's me internal memos from Shell that they knew about global warming in the 70s. There, I, I read a, a, a newspaper article from 1911 or 1900 where they're talking about greenhouse gases. They're talking about the global warming. We knew from the industrial age that we were having this impact on our environment. 1897. 1897 was the first printed mes mention <laughs> oh, oh. of anthropogenic climate change. This is a beautiful lead up to something that I looked into prior to this episode, because I have to be honest, I wasn't completely aware of the backyard oil rigs in California. Excuse me. And I was very curious as to how that came about. And even more curious uh, when I learned how, how well concealed they are all across LA, particularly. I wasn't surprised, but I was interested, right? So uh, you all are talking about how, well, you specifically mentioned flower, how, you know, did we inherently know what we were doing? And even if we didn't, do we, have we not had enough time by now to reflect and say, hey, we should do things a different way, right? Uh, right. But it never ceases to amaze me how no matter how blatant the destruction that we are causing is, we cling to archaic legislation and belief systems that perpetuate the destruction that we're causing. Uh, an example would be the, the backyard oil rigs, where apparently, um, I guess around uh, the time that the gold rush was phasing out in California and the West and people were giving up mm -hmm. on, on striking it mm -hmm. rich there, uh, they discovered... Uh, black gold or oil. liquid gold or right. what have you, oil, mm -hmm. right? So around 18, 1860, apparently, that became normal to 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 drill for oil or, or what have you. And then fast forward into 1930-something, and it, and it became uh, a part of legislation. People unanimously voted to uh, approve backyard oil rigs. Like, you could put them anywhere you wanted in town, in your own backyard, no, in the church's seriously. backyard. seriously. Anywhere. Yeah. And, and to this day, we allow it. They're still in people's backyards. I know, They're still in people's backyards today. But yes, and I, the the majority. It seems like yeah. the majority the majority of the oil fields are in. Right. Uh, the biggest oil field is in Inglewood. It's in. They're all in like black neighborhoods. And, oh, and yeah. the water and the air 
are are so polluted there. They're all they're unlivable. They're like Mad Max wasteland level uh, uh, toxic. But so here's the here's the truly insane thing about the the short sightedness uh, short sightedness of it all. We were looking into this for a potential act, action when I was doing uh, environmental activist work in L.A. And uh, there's an oil rig in Beverly Hills High School. Yes. And they like <laughs> they disguised it. They like painted no it in this really cheesy way. And they literally call it the Freedom Tower. Mm-hmm. They're, right. they're sending their children to this high school. All over it. That's straight yeah, out it's, of the it's, it's in their children's fiction, high school. Maybe. It's absolutely absurd. Um, I kind of feel fiction. like I, I want to bring I want to uh, bring Matt more into the conversation here. I want to draw on your extensive expertise, my friend, uh, to talk about uh, how how does how does climate change sort of um, represent the the most total and compelling reason to shift to a moneyless society. I mean, if you were to sum it up, I would say to try to do enough on time as opposed to too, too little, too late, you know? And I mean, if you're going to do something, do it right. Like you said, you know, go big or go home. And uh, I mean, I don't, I don't really think that we can curtail, you know, the amount of production, uh, you know, just consumption, fossil fuel use, uh, resource, uh, you know, just use in general and, really just waste of a lot of it in a sense you know when you when you consider that most of it really isn't doing anything except just perpetuating the capitalist system and it's the system itself that that keeps it you know having to go essentially it's 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 the system of capitalism itself and lending uh you know constantly needing inflation to keep up with uh you know population and things like that uh that just really they don't give us any choice except to keep on consuming more right. and more and, and to using more and more resources. Uh, and it's, that's really not going to stop. Even if we make capitalism so, you know, a quote unquote sustainable, that mechanism will still exist. You know, there will still be the, the profit incentive there. The economy will still need growth and things like that. And I, I don't see us doing enough on time without trying to really put some of those systems in check or just completely eradicate them in, in essence make them obsolete with better models at the same time you know so we can start sequestering carbon like we really need to be you know and and, and focus on what really needs to be done essentially i mean co- covid kind of you know put gave us a new perspective on a lot of that too because i mean within the first few weeks of the economy shutting down all of a sudden there were what blue skies in la the smog was gone and right, I mean, it, yeah. it, it made a difference yeah. you know it obviously it wasn't everything that we needed to do but you know with within just a matter of weeks it was amazing how clear the air was in a lot of places mm-hmm. and uh mm-hmm. i mean there was a noticeable uh, effect on on the uh amount of carbon that was being ejected into the atmosphere at that at that certain point of time i, I forget the exact name for it but the graph that charts the carbon that's way up in the mountain on i forget wherever it is um you know but there was a noticeable effect for the economy shutting down for whatever it was the you know a few weeks or month or two in essence and and that's the kind of change that we're going to need because as soon as the economy started picking back up again then that curve just started going right back up you know and we can do all this sustainable mm-hmm. stuff regarding energy consumption and energy use but if our production really goes unchecked that's um you know a big a big part of the uh a big part of the solution as well and i i don't i don't see society really being able to do enough on time without addressing that aspect of it at the same time as addressing you know the fossil fuel use um as well it's a it's a two-sided coin essentially you know we have to we have to address the socioeconomic system as well as its uh you know individual components underneath it that make up the energy and transportation and uh, everything else like that amanda you got something uh, just just to add to that, you know, how can we make optimal use of the time that we have if we don't make optimal use of the technology that we have? Every bit of technology we have right now is being used for literally wasteful, inefficient, destructive forces. So I was curious um, if, if Alan wouldn't mind to start with an answer to this question and Flower certainly follow up if you like. If you could see any technology implemented in the way of uh, carbon sequestering, I'm sorry, we'll back up on that, carbon sequestering, or, or any, any implement as far as technology goes that, that, uh, that, that would help to repair the, the climate issues that we're faced today, what would that be and what do you think standing in the way of using it? Los Angeles and all big urban areas 
in the United States where most of Americans live, public transportation and getting over the individualism of I need to be in my own fucking car. Or, or okay, need gonna, to be uh, independent, period, at least toxically independent. Right, yeah. That's definitely that we, a problem. But also creating smaller hubs of communities as opposed to suburban areas where, this is part of the problem with suburban areas, you have to drive to a market. You, ha you can't walk to a market. You can't walk to school. I remember walking to school. Now everyone gets driven to school, gets driven everywhere. My mom didn't, my dad didn't drive us nowhere. We walked. This is considered the norm. Car culture itself is is such a cartel with the fossil fuel industry. It's like you need, you know, if, if, unless we address car culture and, and the, you know, the obsession we have with cars, we're not really going to address fossil fuel use either because it's like, exactly. you know, that's, even though, uh, you know, fossil it's... fuels are burned for electricity and used for plastic and all these other things. I mean, that's kind of the, one of the central drivers. I mean, actually data centers are currently the biggest use user of fossil fuels. So Amazon's data centers, Facebook, Google's data centers, it takes uh, right. the, the equivalent of uh, every Google search can basically takes the, the equivalent energy used to power a light bulb. But it, car culture itself is so toxic and it's so inefficient and ineffectual. It's like cars are such a big wasteful machine that requires so many parts and components. And it's this huge cartel that you're totally dependent on. It's like you can't really get around in this world without a car. And the car companies I make know. sure to keep it that way. And it's it's a huge it's a huge I just keep using the word cartel but it, it's two it's multiple powerful uh, corporate entities corporate industries that have you over a barrel that have a direct say in the design of our society to over an to oil barrel tailor things they got this over an oil barrel yeah to tailor things to their needs so that we need to go through them to live our lives it, it, it's kind of a d uh, direct question uh, to 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 Marlo. Um, just a, a, a little tiny question. Do you, and, and this, this isn't meant to be like a gotcha, gotcha, but like, I just want to know, like kind of, mildly as a joke, but like, do you think that the, um, the lack of, um, adaptation on be, uh, in, in terms of the American roadway t to, uh, g move away from intersections to traffic circles, do you think that that is a plight by, uh, by car and gas companies to sell more gas? Because it makes us just, disgustingly inefficient i mean the amount of gas that and electricity and just time that is wasted at traffic lights is pretty freaking ridiculous I've, I've been wondering that ever since i became aware of traffic circles i thought why do we not do this here but then um it Rooney kind of boots. Uh, i was i was hitchhiking in canada and this this uh this crazy woman who was probably on meth picked us up and uh She's talking on the phone the whole time while she's driving. She's like, "I'm about to hit the Rundi boot." <laughs> yeah, I think it's totally a, a, a scam. I mean, it's the mo traffic circles and traffic lights, and it's interesting to look at uh, you know um, breakdowns of of the efficiencies of different traffic uh, infrastructural designs. And I mean, it's like traffic lights have got to be one of the most wasteful and stupid designs. I mean, they just they're just basically it seems like they're designed to keep you pissed off, to make people angry, to be inefficient. I mean, I completely loathe traffic lights. I literally screamed at the top of my lungs earlier today because I hit eight eight lights in a row. Like they're not even synchronized. I mean, like I've just lost my goddamn marbles so many times. I think, you know, just sitting there and watching a hundred cars burn traffic. So like, you know, one car they'll, they'll hold they'll they'll stop a line of three hundred cars. You know, so one car could cross the road when it could have crossed it about 40 times in the last three minutes while it was sitting at the red light. And I'm like, God, the inefficiency of such a system. All, all over the world, too. Yeah. yeah, no, like that. that's kind of uh, my, my thing. It's almost like a type of planned obsolescence of sorts. You know right. what I'm saying? I, I got an answer to your question, Alan. It's, it's, a, it's a combination between the cartel of incumbents of uh, car manufacturers and big stand-up comedians like Jay Leno, who, uh, you know, as long as capitalism is stupid and inefficient, they always have bad jokes to, to tell. What is the deal with traffic circles? I am willing <laughs> to bet, like, it, I, 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 I was thinking this, 
like when um when, when COVID first started, I was like, you just know that if there was an actual campaign for someone that was, that was like running a campaign to like fix America's infrastructure and started talking about traffic circles instead of traffic intersections, you just know that Republicans would start coming out here and like getting sentimental about traffic lights and be like, when well, my grandpappy would take us to the beach, we would love like stopping at the traffic light and like laughing at things <laughs> and just, and talking. You just know that they would simp for the for the traffic stops. So entirely true because uh, particularly the Republican Party, not to play the divisive bipartisan card, but particularly the uh, the Republican Party profits off of these inefficient logistics. I yeah. mean, that's that's at the core of the monetary society. If it's sustainable, it's not profitable. Therefore, the enemy of anyone out there to make a dollar. And that's why I root for um, changing people's mindsets about it, not just trying to entice and convert based on sheer facts, but helping people go back far enough to see how these systems originated and, and to realize the logical fallacies in them and, and just the pure ridiculousness of it all. Gosh, that's great. Amanda, so you are talking about implements a, a second ago as well. Um, I'm curious uh, to ask Alan, what do you find as, I mean, as far as not, you know, uh, Aside from completely overhauling the capitalist system into, into a moneyless society like we ideally would like to do, what do you think are some of the best implements that exist right now that we could implement, you know, short of changing the entire system? Like, for instance, I saw um, the movie Kiss the Ground not too long ago about regenerative agriculture, uh, you know, the power of soil to sequester carbon, um, no tilling, farming, things like that. I'm curious. What 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 part also do you think tilling? Uh, how bad how bad is tilling actually? How much is that really contributing to climate change? How much of a difference will no till farming make? Um, how much of a difference can regenerative agriculture by um, you know by way of like intensive cattle grazing and things like that to help uh, you know restore grasslands and soil sequestration? How much can that really do? <laughs> Uh, quite a lot. Um, so when it comes to our current agricultural system, it's not based off of um, the most sustainable methods that we observed from even early civilizations or even from um, like from people that weren't even um, having a, um, I, I guess you could say, a, a textbook understanding of science. So like if we looked at indigenous peoples of the Americas, they completely understood the critical importance of crop livestock integration, where they would have multiple species coexisting together in an area to have their own self-feeding loop, right? So that the animals that would eat the vegetation would in turn return those nutrients back into the soil. Um, you can have that with things like, um, I know that in, um, in aquaponic systems, you can have that. Um, there are some talks in terms of um, like um, environmental planning. Uh, people are trying to think of the greatest um, like greenhouses that you can have. And there are some things like black soldier fly larvae that you can introduce in there. Um, if you integrate all of these things together, um, as well as crop rotation, that's another important thing. It's enriching the soil. If there's one thing that can be learned from uh, evolutionary biology, it's that, or at the very least from sexual reproduction, um, is, or heck, even asexual reproduction, it's that diversity is important. It's incredibly important. You can't just have one thing. If you have one thing, then it will ruin the entire process. So that's why when plants, which are asexually reproductive organisms, when they spread all over a place and it's just basically clones of themselves, when a cold snap comes through, they all die. If they're genetically stronger, then they can withstand that. And so that's what we're missing. When we just have one crop in one area soaking up all the nutrients and not being replenished and put back into the soil, then it'll just get completely screwed up. That's that's part of the reason why palm forests are so, like palm oil uh, plantations, I should say, are so dangerous. Because not only do they rip out the native biodiversity um, and then replace them with just palm, uh, but then the palm trees are done after after only a short amount of time. Another one uh, would, would be shrimp farms um, in, the, in the same part of the world. Shrimp farms, I believe, only in, in, at least the ones that are created, they only last like six years. They do not last a very long time. So um, in terms of agricultural, um, I don't have too much um, to say um, to that. I don't have enough of the raw numbers. Um, but in terms of other technologies um, that we have at our disposal as of current, 
I would say that th there's a system called the Molina Olga system. It's a waste gasification method. So basically, it's taking tr plastic and trash and converting it into carbon pellets. You, there's also a technology that can literally rip carbon out of the atmosphere, turn it into pellets, mm -hmm. and then repurpose it into fuel once again. It's basically just recycling the carbon. And then when it gets fed back into the system and re-emitted, then it just gets looped. It's basically like putting it through a filter. So that way, whatever is emitted is harmless, then whatever is recycled is the harmful stuff. So you are literally taking every ounce of energy possible and then using it. So since we have such a plastic problem and since we have such a carbon problem in our atmosphere, if those two things were widely implemented, I think that the that the effects would be tremendous. I mean, I, I, I do think that there is um, merit to things like photovoltaic cells and geothermal is another really big one. Um, tidal energy is another one that's so huge. Um, air currents are things that are underutilized. Um, kinetic energy is another one. People are constantly moving. And if you just... I. If you just added a turbine to the side of a road, the right. amount of wind that's generated by those vehicles could be used to power nearby buildings. People that go to the gym by lifting weights, like doing rowing machines, running on treadmills, that could be like every facet of our energy grid could be revamped. But yeah, in that's terms a really of cool idea too. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I was just going to interject too. Like I've seen, um, there's a couple of islands that, have, that provide their 100% renewable electricity, and. Um, you know, they're using like kinetic energy, essentially, like when when they have enough energy through wind, they pump the water up somewhere high into a different reservoir. And then when the wind uh, dies down, essentially, they're using that second reservoir as energy storage, right? So the water drains from the first reservoir down into the second reservoir, spins turbines on its way, uh, you know, when there's not enough wind. And, and through mechanisms like that, they've been able to achieve 100% renewable energy all on their own without having any extra, you know, coal or fossil fuel imports. Um, but I exactly what you're talking about there. Go, go ahead, Zach. I, I see I, you got something. I mean, the, 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 the point, the, the big point uh, I see of all that, the distillation of all that, what, what you take away from all that is that we have many answers. We right. have many alternatives today. And people like Bill Gates and John Kerry, who I harped on last episode, saying we have, we have, Yet to create 50% of the technology that we need to fight climate change is just ludicrous. It just really shows that these people are invested. They they have huge stakes in certain technologies mm -hmm. winning, certain technologies not winning. And I oh, think yeah. these are the technologies that are not truly renewable, that are not truly free, that do not truly create right. limitless power. Because we can create power from so many different aspects. And, yeah, and, and to... Just... to Oh God! Sorry to interject on that too. I just read Bill Gates's, like a Bill Gates's book. No, there was zero mention of regenerative agriculture in Bill Gates's book on on how to, basically, you know, he he's trying to write this big great book on how to fight climate change and and what needs to happen. Not one single mention of regenerative agriculture. I just, I wanted to reach through the book and and slap him. I was just see that so, is so that disgusted. is fucking insane right. because he he is like the largest technology incumbent in the world, and, and, and you know he's, he knows he's about pulling. It. <laughs> he's yeah of course he does i mean they they know the solutions exist they know about degrowth they know i mean that's that's one of the most important things that is a technology we need to develop economic technology we need to de develop social technology we need to scale back production we need to do like buckminster fuller said to make more with less to get by with less to be more efficient generally but like amanda beautifully articulated the system seeks to profit off of these things it, it likes to keep us in a need that's the whole essence of the economy it's scarcity Exactly, it's and is it and is it's, it any coincidence that Bill Gates owns like a, a huge stake in impo what is it Impossible Burger, the you know the vegan all alternative that you know uses mono cropping and monoculture and everything in order to derive the soy and everything that's needed to make its you know plant based patties and all that. I don't think that's any coincidence at all. Not to mention he is the single largest owner of farmland in the world, and he's not doing anything about regenerative agriculture. Get fucked, Bill. Right? No. Seriously. <laughs> the, it, it, I mean, e even if he didn't, it's like, does he really expect us to believe that him, a philanthropist that operates most of his uh, brownie point scoring campaign out in Africa, a place that has been ravaged by <laughs> by climate catastrophe droughts, like a place that is notoriously dry, do we really think that he's going to be operating out of that region and not think about agriculture? I mean, come on, Bill. Come on. I mean, malaria is literally a waterborne <laughs> a waterborne problem like the mosquitoes breed in the water and then spread throughout that like for god's sake he's he's he's, he's so uh, it's beyond like, ridiculous 
the like the, the how how does he think that we're this stupid like why does he continuously insist on insulting our own intelligence by thinking that we're not smart enough to be able to just see something like this it is so readily apparent it's laughable agreed go ahead flower you got your hand up or sorry it's not just him who thinks we're that ignorant well i mean it's the structure of our system it's the social structure around it that these people are inculcated in that world that they they grew up thinking that i mean they grew up completely cut off from people around them they grew up in a in a multi-million dollar mansion i mean bill gates is is spends his free time gallivanting around the third world you know just every day experiencing the, the most dire poverty on earth and he doesn't stop to wonder like man i don't deserve the i deserve 10 you know 100 billion times more than these people have literally i deserve this much i i i should have this I, it's really, it's miraculous, and it, it's it's not just a personal failing. I I think this is something I have to crusade against because it ultimately it, it, it's it's satisfying to say fuck Bill Gates. It's satisfying to say fuck these people that they're bad people that they failed the game. But it's ultimately more individualism. It's saying you are a personal failure, not a failure of a system, of a structure, of a uh, familial and social inculcation of conditioning that they are conditioned to think this way and it's not even just that they're conditioned this way it's that the structure of the of the economy that separates winners from losers haves from have-nots people in power from people you know people in mansions from people in the dirt is that it it, it separates you from it and it, it it inhibits your ability to empathize it inhibits your ability to read people's faces and, and, and understand them empathetically this is not just uh rich men bad it's it's neuroscience that that we've we've we're studying the brain and we understand that that when you cut people off like this from other people they don't understand what it's like they, they cannot fathom somebody else's lived experience mm-hmm. and they can't self-reflect to the point where they see where somebody like bill gates is so absurd that he he has this this philanthropist hero status and elon musk and all these people you know uh bezos naming his his stadium climate pe- pledge stadium and saying that he cares very much about climate change it's like if you care about these things you have to see that the system and the structure of our economy is the problem that's the str- that's the problem that we keep right. uh, continuing this and and growing every single year this system that uh thrives on endless production endless growth you need to produce more products at all times for this system to grow and that's not just like corporate greed it's like when you we have these super powerful monopolies that if you don't keep up, if you can't survive, if you can't you know beat your quotas and keep up with your competitors, you die. It's a it's a it's a zero sum game. Absolutely, Alan. Did you have something? I think uh, Flower wanted to interject after you too. Yes, absolutely. Um, two uh, two points. Um, I uh, I mean actually te- technically three i know that marlo and i have conversed in the past about um something to this effect but it's basically discussing the 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 mindset of people that are born at the top of of, of the socioeconomic pyramid if you will or in this case it's not even a pyramid it's more like a burj khalifa uh if you will but um it's that the idea of um almost in the same way as how we have found um that trauma is inherited practically when it comes to people of color from their past enslavement. Um, in that same way, I believe that apathy can be passed on from generation to generation when we're dealing with these old money types. Um, but then, uh, so that, that, that was just a little point to add on to, but then I, I do have, um, a, a question um for, for zach if that's allowed um when, when he's saying how it's easy to like look at bill gates and, and and say you know like like screw bill gates and screw elon and whatever what what is a system though if not a collective of individuals do you know what I, like I, I think that this is a huge conversation and a huge debate in the um in the environmental fight is people trying to figure out um to what end are we as individuals accountable? Because I know that the common figures that are thrown around are going to be that a hundred corporations produce um, 70% of the carbon emissions. And then there was a recent study that just came out. It was a huge groundbreaking study that showed that um, only a few companies um, produce more than 55% of all the single use plastic waste. But we are as a collective 
the things that enable that system to perpetuate. We are the ones that give them the money. We are the ones that allow them to continue doing business. What they continue to be is what we allow them to do. So I think that um, completely, and, and also, of course, the, the very, very famous Utah Phillips quote of that the earth is not dying, it's being killed, and the people that are killing it have names and addresses. I think that they are not exempt from, and I'm not, and I'm not saying that you thought that, that they were exempt, but I think that it's a very important bit of accountability that they are the ones that can change it. Um, so it, like, how many times have you heard those figures of, oh, there was a big study that came out and said that homelessness could be fixed with just $2 billion. And yes, while it is correct to point out the um, insane military budget, where are these billionaires that are holding an accrued $6 trillion across this planet? Like if they wanted to clean up the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, if they wanted to fix homelessness, if they wanted to fix lack of education, if they wanted to fix all the lead in our pipes, if they wanted to fix all of the oils, then why aren't they doing it? So we should blame them. Well, but no, we should yeah, also blame yeah, ourselves I, I, uh, for to, not to, dragging to do... them out into the street and guillotining them and completely overhauling the system. <laughs> like that See, is to, completely to directly, on us. Res- to directly response to that, I agree. And, I, and I'm not saying at all that these people are, should not be held completely accountable. That, but but I, I see them as, as people that are sick. It's not that they're directly evil. They're people that are diseased. They have a social disease that is an inherited disease that keeps them from understanding, from seeing the world in any way that is real. I mean, they are zealots of the of the money god. They worship this god and they grew up in that church and they are, you know, completely brainwashed to it. So it's like it, it's obvious to to any of us. It's obvious to anybody studying this from any serious discipline that the economic system is the problem, that wealth inequality is the problem, that that the, the you know, for Bill Gates to say he cares about wealth inequality and he's trying to vaccinate people because of it, it's insanity. It's deluded insanity. So these people I I feel like of course, we need to hold them accountable, but I don't think that they ever will hold themselves accountable because of the structure of the society. Let me let me let me let me get a point out here real quick that they're not going to fix. They're not going to change it. And I, and I think this kind of brings us into the more revolutionary perspective, the revolutionary conversation that needs to accompany any climate conversation that we need to change this, that we do have responsibility. You know, we're not going to change this by voting with our dollars. We're not going to change this by changing our consumer habits or going vegan or any of these things. We're going to change this by by completely inverting the pyramid, inverting the Burj Khalifa, that by saying these people who only have power because we collectively believe in the valid the validity of the money that they have that makes them powerful. If we don't believe in that money, if we say, OK, this money doesn't mean anything. This money does not make you more intelligent. This money does not make you more truly powerful. It does not make you exempt from the rules of the world. And it, it, is, it is our responsibility. It is our collective and individual responsibility to, co- to come together to switch things up, to, to level things, and not just to cut their heads off, but because that, that's, you know, that, that's, that's not going to really solve or change anything, and it doesn't truly uh, go for the root of the system. And the, the set of conditions, both uh, psychological, neurological, and sociological, that create these people and these problems. Well, I, I think, though, that what's the, 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 this is a really big conversation that I've had with plenty of people before in regards to because um, you said that they were sick, um, like you view them more as people that are sick or afflicted, almost victims in, in a sense of the system. Right. We're all um, guilty and no one's to blame. I think we're all responsible and accountable. But, but I think that indoctrination is not enough to plead ignorance. I can think, uh, like, in, for instance, a lot of people think that for other things, um, oh, this person used, uh, like, Thomas Jefferson practiced slavery, but other people owned slaves back then. Like, he didn't know any better. It's like there were plenty of people that were abolitionists back then. There were plenty of people that didn't own slaves that thought it was wrong back in the day. So I sim- and it, when it, you can say this for a myriad of things when it comes to white supremacy and racism. Racism is a learned attribute. That is true. You could make this insane philosophical quandary of what if there was somebody that was raised in a log cabin out in the woods all by themselves with their parents and they were taught to be a Nazi, blah, blah, blah. But then would you still punch that Nazi or would you still kill that Nazi? And the answer is, frankly, yes, because we live right now in the era of information. There is no way that you can still live in this world and think that what you are doing, regardless of how indoctrinated you are, and think that that's all right. There is ample evidence to counter that mindset in its entirety that I do not have any sympathy or hold anything back in it when it comes to the accountability and the way that we should make them suffer for it because they know what they're doing is wrong. There's, you, I, you, I don't you, think I don't think they do, but I want to bring in uh, 
everybody i think we're having too polite a discourse here everybody's uh, abiding by the the finger the holding up their hand rule too much just jump in here let's start throwing let, pies. Let, 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 let amanda the world jump depends in. on this conversation let, let amanda jump in and then i'm next are you sure flower you've been you've been waiting longer than me too polite I, I really too nice don't feel like Bring out that, the claws that these that no the oh, right, lack yeah. of empathy is just no they know they know what they're doing they know what they're doing i agree with you they Don't. definitely do like we were talking earlier uh, enough time has passed from from uh between the time that these uh that, like the origin story of some of the things we still ha see happening today and and today enough time has passed to have learned from our mistakes but at the same time we're also in the era of misinformation, as Neil deGrasse Tyson would argue. Uh, and belief systems are prevalent as ever. And, and, and it's hard for me to wrap my head around, too, because centuries pass and people don't change, and I just can't fathom it uh, for, for many reasons. But I'm going to take us down just a very shallow rabbit hole, and I'm just going to hit a bullet list. Basically, like, have you ever had anybody give you a pathway, like they say, to get to this area, to get to this file, click on this, then this, then this, then that? This is how you get to the root of why indoctrination is so prevalent today, um, especially since the era of industrialization. Of course, there's been class stratification forever and ever, but it was, what is the word? It, it exploded in the era of industrialization because something called Calvinism was directly integrated into the social structure of industrialization. So you have something called divine selection, where Calvinists and Christians uh, believe that there really is a God who shines his light on a select few who award, rewards them with uh, the ability to acquire things. Thus was born infinite acquisition. If you can acquire things, then you are blessed and selected divinely. Now, this meant if God, who was supposed to be benevolent, selected you to be uh, prosperous, then you must be benevolent and thus with your prosperity can lead others to prosperity. And there was born that the whole concept that your leaders per se, the people that you, you, you deem as uh, worthy to lead you to prosperity and offer you security and whatnot, are the ones that you should follow unquestionably. And so today we do still have such deeply indoctrinated mindsets that won't step away from the archaic ways of life simply because of what they believe. And that's basically what most of the monetary system is premised on, acquisition, infinite acquisition, which of course we know is what's destroying the planet. I think it's I think that's a really powerful um avenue of, of it's a powerful lens to look at things because I mean that Calvinist belief system, it's basically neoliberalism. Exactly. And it's and in, right. in, in reading exactly. about uh, like exactly. the, the early Christians I mean, they were they were the socialists of their day. They were, you know, the economically oppressed and deprived, and they organized around theological principles because that's the language that they understood the world in. Today, ec economic principles are used to justify this, you know, uh, orthodoxy of capitalism. This orthodoxy and this ascendancy, this Calvinist ascendancy of Bill Gates has the most money, therefore he worked the hardest and he deserves it, and blah 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 blah. It, these people, they grow up in that. I think that we we have to defend ourselves against these people. We can't uh, we can't uh, absolve them of responsibility. But I think also they really they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand. And it, it's 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 harder to look that in the eyes. It's easier to feel like, oh, okay, you know that you're killing the world and you're just doing it anyway. That is true insanity. That is true and profound insanity that somebody at the Shell Corporation could read a memo that says, oh, okay, you keep doing this, the world is going to end. It's like, is anybody that evil that they would kill their own grandson, that they would put poison in the water of their own child? That is a true level of insanity that is unparalleled in the, in the human story before. That is a, a level of delusion and megalomaniacal, uh, just a cracking up of all that it is to be human, all that it is to be normal and sane and moral and connected to any reality that we live in, that people are so wrapped up in this reality of money and power and the survivalism that runs it, that these people really think they're fighting for their lives. They really believe it. And that that is a, a much harder to reconcile thing than to just be like, okay, yeah, this is so obviously wrong to me that it's got to be obvious to you. It's not obvious. And, and, and that's uh, Terrence McKenna defined ideology as that which subverts or distorts the obvious. And it's, it's obvious to us that we, we know better. But 
and I think this is a difficult thing. Alan, you actually posted this article on your wonderful Instagram page, horrible Instagram page, pessimistic environmentalist on Instagram. Please follow it. One of my favorite, favorite pages uh, will ruin your day consistently. And uh, I live for that because it fires me up. But uh, it was about how facts don't change people's minds anymore or never did. And the thing that changes people's minds most is an appeal, is a direct and personal appeal. Flower, you are dying to say something. Jump in here. The reason a lot of people, especially Calvinists or, 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 or evangelists, don't see it is because of their doctrinization towards the um, Armageddon and, and the rapture. They believe, they truly believe, and they want the end of the world, and they want this to happen because they believe that once this happens, there will be the resurrection, and they'll all live in an earthly paradise designed by their God. Um, why, why is um, Calvinism the, 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 the only direct denomination of Christianity for your ire, if I may inquire? That it's not just Cal I don't believe that it's just Calvinists. They truly believe that the rapture is what will save them. A lot of them believe that we have to go through this destruction of the earth in order to destroy the evil on the planet and then have a resurrection of all the good. See, I feel God like there are there provided. are certain there are certainly people out there who are who are maybe they're accelerationists of some kind, maybe they just are just defending the status quo. But I feel like in in almost every setting, economic doctrine and zealotry overrides theological doctrine or moral doctrine. I think uh, one of my favorite thinkers, writers of the time right now, Caitlin Johnstone, said it really brilliant, she, brilliant, brilliantly. She said, humans are not rational beings. We are rationalizing beings. That these are the excuses people use to justify what they are sort of triggered by their trauma and their survival and their power structures to do anyway. That they are seeking their power, their affluence, and they, they truly believe that, that it's us against them, that if they don't do it, someone else will, et cetera. They believe that this is the way of the world, that this is natural, that, that you know, survival of the fittest and this domination, like, like people use, have used, you know, Darwinism, evolution. They've used science to justify this as well. Any, any belief system can be manipulated and perverted to uh, justify a bias. And that bias is motivated by trauma. It's motivated by uh, in, in, insecurity inadequacy and scarcity not to totally uh you know uh generalize because there are insane nut jobs out there that probably I'm, I'm writing this crazy uh dystopian uh future near-term thing and, and one of the villains is uh he's he's like a uh an evan an evangelical nut who is uh, like this this worship pastor who's going around spreading plagues and um he's he wants to his plan is to nuke the ice caps to bring on the uh the rapture I just wanted to say that Flower made some great points um, in regards to the, the religious aspect of why we are still destroying our planet when Zilio, it's as you say, and I'm sorry, embellicals. <laughs> I can't talk today. And then my, it's like a 90 degrees in here, and my lips are cotton. Anyway, when the religious sector wants to go to another world per se there the, the objective is the afterlife why would they preserve mm -hmm. the earth i mean one of right. their own There's doctrines no, they is no the reason. earth is temporary they have no reason right so yeah. but that's a sidetrack but to answer uh, alan's question the reason i dropped calvinism um was because it was directly in line with the the single point i was trying to make about how climate crisis was exasperated if not catapulted at the point of um industrialization and the fact that the reason that church and state had to be separated is because Calvinism particularly is what was um, <clears throat> directly integrated into the ideology of why you should work and toil and acquire. Uh, and let me, let me just follow that up with the fact that obviously there's a myriad of religious practices across the globe where a lot of them expect that there will be an afterlife and there's no use in preserving anything here. So I'm not sure where your questioning was going there, Alan, but I'm happy to try and further answer. I'd kind of like to kind of rein things back in to the, the sort of central topics here. I think there's so many natural tangents built into this, this, this topic. 
uh, we, we could take this in any direction. I'd kind of just like to bring Matt back into the discussion here and, and see what's your perspective on this or what are some aspects of this that you'd like to develop or discuss or, or put this brain trust to the use in, in uh, <laughs> discursing. We're going to have to have all of you on the show again. I can't, I'm having a blast. I could do this all I, day. I, I agree. This time is going by way too quickly. Right. Yeah. No, we don't, we don't have a heck of a lot of time left, do we? I was just curious, since you're kind of a, you know, a climate change uh, expert, so to speak, um, or at least you've studied the subject a lot, Alan, I'm curious, um, what are the chances of us actually doing enough here before we encounter a runaway climate change scenario? How, how close are we to that? What are some things that are happening right now, possibly, that might indicate that we've already gone too far. I mean, I know a couple of them off the top of my head. There's the, what, the coral reefs, the uh, Atlantic meridian current or something like yes. that. Um, I think those are two biggies as well as the permafrost. It, it, I, I think, is there anything else that I'm missing? Real quick before he goes in there, the permafrost it, it, uh, in the ice caps, and I, I tried to do a joke about this in my little stand-up routine a couple episodes ago, but it's it's a nightmare. I mean, it, it's it's the... It's the most terrifying thing I can imagine because there is these these layers of permafrost in the Arctic, and uh, if if they melt down far enough, there are enormous pockets and kind of bombs of carbon of you know life forms that have died and been stored there for thousands to you know millions of years. That if we melt down to that level, and they are all released, they're they're the equivalent of like like years or even decades of, of carbon being released all at once, and not only that. Will it will it be this this somebody cranking up the thermostat on Earth, exploding? You know, like the like the effects of a nuclear war or something. There are viruses stored in the ice that we have no uh, immunity no to. We have immunity no resistance to, to that, that no we have immunity, not experienced no, ever in our species, nothing. perhaps that are in right. in the Arctic. So the time it's completely the, crazy. The timeline, the, the grains in the hourglass are running out. Every single day, every second we talk, every second that the uh, the marker on the recorder is 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 going, we the end is is looming closer. And Alan, I think, is the actually the probably the best person I know to talk about this. So, I mean, unleash the pessimistic environmentalist, Alan. <laughs> so one 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 of the things that gets referenced a lot is the uh, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is going to be like that ocean atmosphere. It, it's basically in the Pacific Basin um, because a lot of people just um, they, they, the the reason that I was talking earlier about the different biomes and such is because um, people don't realize how um, how much our health is in connection with things that happen far away. Um, so, for instance, when it comes to um, atmospheric um, shifts, when it comes to oceanic currents, so let me just paint this picture for you as, as best as I can to try and answer um, both your things. But don't worry, Matt, I will give you a completely direct answer later. Um, but um, essentially, um, when the Earth heats up, uh, two things happen. Um, one of them is that our ice caps melt. Um, ice and snow are going to be white. Um, the albedo effect is the process by which sunlight is deflected off of light-colored surfaces and absorbed by dark-colored surfaces. When snow and ice melt, they turn into water. When they are connected together, they turn into a dark blue, which is darker than white, and therefore it heats up the oceans. So... The, the warmer we get, the less snow and ice we get, which means, that, once again, with the scale analogy, that means the more water we have. The more water we have, when that heats up, it expands. Not only that, but then it also homogenizes the mixture of the ocean. The saline solution of the ocean changes. Once the Earth gets hotter, it also starts to absorb more of that carbon dioxide, and therefore the acidity changes. And so that's what's killing off coral reefs. The other thing that happens, though, when the Earth gets hotter is desertification, which is where those forests are starting to change as well. So the albedo effect, once again, is being thrown out of whack, and all that carbon is being re-released back into the air. And so then what starts to happen is when the oceans start to change in their acidity um, and in their temperature, the currents stop moving. Therefore, the air above it stops moving as well. So what we're seeing is when it comes to Africa, for instance, the fertile air that is being carried around Africa and across the Atlantic Ocean is now stopping because those fertile air go across the Atlantic Ocean and into the Amazon rainforest. And then if you were to look at the Earth, it would loop back around. So if it starts here and it goes across the ocean, where is it going next? It's going up. Where does it land? It lands here in California, right in our Central Valley. So the health of Africa and the health of the Amazon 
affect us here. That's why when so many people were asking, why should we care about the Amazon rainforest when it's so far away? Never mind all of the lost biodiversity. Never mind the fact that that is a carbon sequestering hub on planet Earth. But it's also, if you really only care about local events, then guess what? This is a local one. We get our fertile airs from them. So there's that. Uh, to speak to your point, though, directly, Matt, when it comes to what's our chance of pulling this off and like what are some signs of um, like some, some of the last um, pillars that we have left. Um, well, as, um, as, uh, as Marlo mentioned, um, my page is called The Pessimistic Environmentalist. That is the name of my book um, that I'm soon to be finishing. The reason why is because as someone who is immersed in this fight and has been for my entire life, ever since I was 10 years old and I wrote an essay on it in 2006, I see zero reason to believe that the situation will change. Right? It's like when you see old political cartoons from the 17 and 1800s and you realize that nothing has changed fundamentally. There is nothing that can change in a short enough span of time for this to be avoided. Um, it is simply a matter of how bad will it get it's not a matter of will it be bad it's how bad will it be and so when it comes to the environmental aspects we're looking at anywhere between one and ten million years for the planet to recover its lost biodiversity um it really just depends on if we suck enough carbon out of the atmosphere because that will have a lasting effect we're um here are just some facts to reinforce why i'm a pessimist uh, we are experiencing an extinction die-off rate that is ten thousand times faster than the natural path the Earth goes through cycles of warming and cooling. We all know this. These are called Milankovic cycles. They take like 90 to 100,000 years to occur. We're supposed to be going through a cooling phase right now. We're at the hottest point ever. Okay, so <laughs> even with a, a natural cooling effect that is a result of the Earth's orbit and its spin and its axis, all of that stuff playing into account, even with that, we are still heating up hotter than ever before. We have seen 70% of insects die in the past 50 years. We have seen 30% of North American birds die off. We have seen insane amounts of fish, and we have seen lots of uh, large mammals. 99% of freshwater large fish have died. Um, like the, just when you start to piece this all together, every single day I find multiple studies that have been uploaded talking about this and it has been going on since i was uh first suddenly like hyper aware of it in 2017 almost practically every single day we see another study of it is worse than we thought and given the fact that science is a system of thinking that builds upon earlier knowledge um and we have higher statistical probability and confidence levels in what we're talking about which in the case of climate change is a five sigma the highest you can possibly achieve there's just no way that we can look at this and think that there's a way of going back I know that that's a super downer thing to say, but that's where we are now. So it's just, will humans survive it? And if so, how long? There's a very depressing piece. Um, I'll continue going on and then I'll acknowledge uh, Marlo. Um, it is, I would highly recommend that everybody read this. It will scare the daylights out of you, but I, I, ignorance is bliss when it comes to this. You need to read this. This is one of the most important things that I could ever recommend somebody read. It is called The Survival of the Richest. It is an article that was written on Medium, I believe. Uh, it was by a tech insider, and it was talking about how he was in a meeting with um, Anonymous. Their uh, identities have not been disclosed. Um, uh, but uh, one percenters that are asking about what happens when the event occurs. How will we keep our guards in check? How will we keep our vaults protected? These people have apocalypse bunkers ready to go. They have vaults of food and water. They have air filters and water filters. They have greenhouses underground. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is a thing. And so when it comes to thinking about survival and will we make it, you and I will not. The billionaires will. It will be a snow piercer like apocalypse, but instead of on a train in an Arctic wasteland, it will be underground with a Mad Max dystopia going on above ground. So all we can do now is just hope that the people that do make it through that are able to find these things and just blast them to hell so then humans can just leave this earth alone <laughs> end rant <laughs> flower you had something to say and then i have another i have a counter rant ellen i've known about this for quite a while it's really hard for me to even talk to my children about it or my grandchildren and it's kind of sad because all i want to do is buy a car and drive around the country 
and live out the rest of my life and take my grandchildren with me and show them the beautiful places on this earth. And then people don't realize it's going to happen really fast. They think that we have 50 years. We do not have 50 years. We do not have 25 years. We only have a few years, you guys. People don't realize this. It's, it's like really, really short because today the, the Arctic Circle was like up around Russia was 90 degrees today and 98 degrees at the at, at 89 degrees at the Arctic Circle. And it's what, May? I mean, five okay. years, honestly, if, if we're lucky. So if when, when it comes to when, when, when it comes to us, Matt, I, I, I'm noticing and observing and recording these um, th- these things, um, such as like microplastics at the bottom of the ocean, microplastics in snow, microplastics in the Arctic Circle. These are things that show that it is a system already in decay. We have already lost. If we start to see plastic in our precipitation. We're, f- we're we're just fucked. Like that's just. Well, I think they've they've already found plastic on the tops of uh, some of the highest mountains in the world. That's yes, coming down exactly. It, right, and they've found it in the children's urine too. They find they find it in in kids' urine. Pretty much all the kids that they've tested. Yeah. Uh, one of the most saddening things to me is the loss of the coral coral reefs because those won't ever come back. Those those will be gone for. I mean, well, I mean, not at least not any time on that humans will be on the planet. But those are already, I think, half the the Great Barrier Reef is already fifty percent gone. I and think that now. is a that, that's actually an old figure, as well. Is yeah, it? um, Jeez. it's we, we have yet to update our um, our coral reef count because what happens is um, the coral reefs. Um, so when the, the driving force behind evolution by natural selection are changes in the environment, and when that happens, animals have three options: they can either migrate and move, they can adapt and evolve, or they can go extinct. Obviously, adaptations and evolution only occur with random mutations. So you cannot you cannot choose that, and so animals do not have a conscious choice in doing that. And so what's happening is they can't change. If you need any more evidence of that, just try and take your pet goldfish and change out their tank and put them in a glass of water that you have not tested the temperature of. That's what we're dealing with here. And so that's like when it comes to coral yeah. reefs, any bit of change in the oceanic currents, and it will just completely cut them off. Right. Yeah. Mass bleaching events just in over a matter of days, like these huge fields of coral reefs are alive. And then two days later, it's dead simply because the water got too hot. Yes. And then, and then the coral reef dies and breaks apart and you just have this, you know, toxic sludge essentially in the water. From what I've seen, I, I watched a documentary on not too long ago. It was really, really sad what's happening. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Zach, go ahead. Well, I, I, I feel like I have to, uh, I have to tilt at this windmill that Alan has set up and, and, you didn't set it up, Alan. You didn't. You didn't. Uh, you didn't. You didn't invent agriculture and create the monetary system and the uh, unnecessary hierarchies and scarcity that have driven us to fossil capitalism and colonialism and the industrialization and and the overall rape of the world. You didn't start this, but I I feel like I have to address that directly because I I am perhaps against my better judgment, perhaps against the. Uh, bulk of the weight of the crushing weight of the knowledge that I carry in my head every single day that despite what most of the people in my life and my relationships feel that I am a pessimistic nihilistic depraved and dark and disgusting mind that that just can't that just you know just let us be happy you know I am an optimist I do believe I believe that the human race can transcend I believe that we can overcome this I, I, no, that may be an insane is. belief. Maybe, <laughs> uh, maybe I will go to my death believing that, but I would rather go to my death believing that than accepting that this is it. That this is why we killed the world. For what? For money. For a dollar. For something completely illusory. For a, a god, a, a completely secular and false god that rules this world cruelly, stupidly, and inefficiently. That I believe in, in one thing. I believe in life. I believe in nature. I believe in this earth itself. I believe the earth is an intelligence far greater than us. That uh, I don't believe that evolution is totally random. I, I, I mean, you, you can see this in, in species that evolve and adapt together. That, that uh, ecosystems themselves generate life forms to, to fit niches. And we are just such a thing. We, we, were, uh, we exist for a purpose, like you said earlier. We exist for a reason. This this earth is not a mistake. I don't think that it can be can be so utterly ravaged for such a, a, a petty and small mistake. I believe in humanity. I believe in the earth. I believe right now, just like we're having this conversation, there are people all over this world having it and having it in, in more intense ways and organizing 
and building and creating. And like we were talking about earlier, the solutions exist. They, they are tantalizingly close, and every single one of them is closer to bringing us to a better world for everyone, a better world than we have ever had, that, that can take out the traffic lights and can take out the, the sickness and the plastics, that we have innovations that can solve all of these individual problems, but we cannot solve these problems if the solution, if the solution creating solution or the problem creating problem of the system is allowed to perpetuate, and that is money. This is in its own dark and twisted way it's, it's the greatest opportunity money. that we have ever had to transcend beyond all of humanity's money, bad habits, our exploitation our waste our stupidity our ignorance and arrogance and self-centeredness our individualism that pits us against our own family members that that this insanity that i described earlier we can cure it by really staring our death in the face that there is nothing more powerful in breaking people out of a delusion than life attacking than life slamming them into a brick wall of it of its own reality the reality of what we are going through that this is real and when people start realizing this en mass because propaganda is incredibly powerful and effective and ingenious at keeping people from seeing what's obvious from seeing what i have seen my whole life that we are not living in touch with nature but i believe in the human being i believe in the human spirit i believe that if this profit motive, this system that has that that pushes people, forces people, so many of them to generate, to devote their entire lives to the generation of arbitrary and insane profit for no reason, that 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 that, that has bottled up the potential of of so many people on bullshit jobs, on things that mean nothing. If that potential can be unleashed by taking out that wall, that chain that keeps us all from our own potential, from our, from being able to innovate, from being able to collectively put our heads together and solve this problem. Because that's what we do, we solve problems. That's, that's, that's at the core of what we are as creatures. That is our adaptation. We are able to put our heads together and solve problems. And we, are, we have been put into this condition, this problem that has never been met before. And the immensity of it is still not felt, but it will be. And as we are, as we were radicalized by it, so will more people and more people and more people. And as we come together, I, I really truly believe we can do this. We can fix this. And it will, be, it will be the solution to all of our problems. We can truly create a utopia out of this doomsday scenario. Necessity is the mother of innovation. That is the thing that drives um, all the, the ecological niches to which you were alluding to. That's a result of adaptive radiation when there is a void, a vacuum that is left by a paucity of organisms to occupy those regions. The only way that people are genuinely motivated um, is going to be through um, fear. Optimism is not a motivator. Um, fear, unfortunately, is dire situations. A deadline is something that can motivate people. Right now, what we're seeing are neoliberals touting positivity and saying, no, we can do this. We have 50 years to do it. If you tout positivity, but then you say that there are only five years left, people will then resort to it's over. Humans live for one thing and one thing only, and that's to contradict and prove each other wrong. They live to spite each other. If you tell them they can't do it, they'll go out of their way to prove you wrong. So I think that in a bit of reverse psychology, you can persuade them. The reason why my life path has meandered as much as it has through film and politics and science is because of the three main branches of persuasion, the pathos, the logos, and the ethos. People are not anymore persuaded by logic and facts anymore. They're persuaded by emotion. So the emotion that we pick is very important. And I would make the strong case that just as I would argue that religion is one of the biggest detriments to the fight against climate change, if, and if not the source of it, I think you have to look at that eschatological mindset that has motivated so many people to destroy the earth and instead use that to motivate them to save it. I think well, to, that's to, to, to counter to counter that uh, quick, you know, quickly before diving into a whole nother rabbit hole. I think the, the motivator of human beings is, is so variable that perhaps the, the, the compromised diseased human being that this for-profit system has developed and created that may, maybe that, that stubbornness and that spitefulness is baked into them. But the human being exists far beyond the reaches of capitalist ideology that the human being goes goes far deeper into that and there are there are innumerable religious and spiritual traditions in this world that their core principles are respect of and worship of nature but that as the, an empiricist I, 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 I recommend i recommend everybody listening to this watch the film aluna a l u n a it's on youtube it's free it's about uh, a group of indigenous peoples who reach out to the west uh with a with a message that 
that the earth is in danger. And it, it's, it's an incredible film, but it just really shows, it gives me hope for humanity because humanity is, is still, humanity is not limited by this personality that this system has, has driven. And this, as this system fails, as it fails completely, it is creating its opposition. It's creating those people there. You said that the that the strongest motivator is fear. I will say that that uh, that 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 anxiety, that stress hormone, can can drive us to do in, in incredible things. But I think the most powerful motivator is love. That a mother's love to save her child from a burning car can can provoke can give us the strength to lift a burn to lift a car. You know, a ninety pound woman can lift a car to save her child, and that's what it's going to take for us to do this. And we can do this because of that. Because if we if we truly look this in the eye and we say, okay. Everything I love is at stake. Every single thing I care about is on fire, and I have to act. Somebody else is not going to do this. They are Fear not going to do this. Fear and love are not mutually exclusive, though. A mother's love, of a 90-pound woman picking up a car happens because she fears that her baby will fucking die. I think that we could argue that the same thing happens with the planet. I'm just picturing, I'm just picturing this, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, gif, or I think it's from Predator or something, of like the two huge muscular arms like, like uh, do, doing the Shahan shake. We, we've got to come together here. You know, we need equal parts insane, zealous optimism that a, a better world is possible. And we need to know the damn truth of what is going to happen if we don't. Uh, flower. So I, uh, flower. Yeah, 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 I was going to say, fl yeah, flower, flower, did you have, to, have something there? Um, I'm really trying not to be pessimistic, but I don't have a lot of faith in humans. I've, I've looked at history so much and we've repeated the same nonsense over and over again. And look at what just happened in Palestine just a few days ago. I mean, really, I just, I'm, I'm basically an atheist and I can't wrap my brain around some other people blowing some other people up on their holy day. And I'm an atheist. I, it just doesn't, it doesn't compute to me. I don't, I can't wrap my brain around it. And I would hope that love would prevail, but I, I, I'm just so pessimistic about it. Okay, I'm gonna let the mic go. How about you, Alan? Any any closing thoughts before we go? Yes, um, I would just say that um, the best way to predict the future is going to be through looking at past events and looking at the evidence that is available to us. Um, uh, it's when we're trying to look at our best chance of making it through this, um, we can hope and we can believe as much as we want. Um, and this isn't meant to come off as aggressive as it probably sounds, but I, I sincerely mean this as a point of just trying to, um, as, as someone who has been seeing um, a lot of these sentiments for as long as I've been in this fight, I think that it's time for almost an awakening of, of sorts um, to, to, to make it to, to be more sobering of, of the sentiment that this is a very real thing and you cannot manifest um, just just in the way that we cannot um, geoengineer our way out of this we cannot manifest our way out of this we, we the only way out of a fight is through it um, I believe that you got to go down swinging and so I'm just looking at what we've done and it's like exactly what flower said a student of history realizes we're repeating the same things over and over again. Um, and so I just encourage people that um, to do the things that are um, uncomfortable when it comes to learning about history, L reading up every single day about this, about the science that is being unraveled every single day. Um, otherwise um, we will continue uh, to live in the reality of Carl Sagan's demon haunted world if you will. Um, this is just an awful, awful existence for me as um, a Sagan fan, as an environmentalist, as a lover of nature. This is just like the worst life I could have ever imagined for my grown up self to live if I was a child. So um, all I want is for people to not live through this, but at the same time, I know that that's not the case. So um, my, 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 my contact info for, for this is, uh, if it goes without saying it's the pessimistic environmentalists, all our case under pessimistic underscore environmentalist. Um, you can reach me there. And what about your book too? Do you want to give us the name of your book or do you have it gone that far yet? You said you're writing the book. Yes. As well. The pessimistic environmentalist is the name of the book. It has yet to hit, uh, shelves as, uh, one of my 
heroes hitchens would say find bookstores everywhere it's not there yet but um best believe that it will be as soon as i can get it done and i will let you um, no one it does um i mean per, ho- hopefully the next time i'm back on here i can say that it's finished <laughs> great and your name your name is alan and how do you pronounce your last name again i'm sorry Chornak is my is my name alan Chornak. Yeah. c-h-o-r-n-a-k yes right? sir so perfect to, just for everyone listening alan, out there. alan to you and flowers sort of closing remarks and to that lingering pessimistic statement to anybody listening i, I i'd like to say something rather simply that the cycle of human history is all too it's all too predictable and stupid and silly and petty, but we can see that now. And we, we truly have the technology and the awareness. The awareness is the most powerful thing. The awareness is really what's going to change things. A true and penetrating awareness that breaks through all this flimsiness of our identification with these systems and structures and personalities and, and idiotic delusions that we can see the cycle. And it, it's so predictable. So I think... I can only imagine what human what humanity can do if we can truly look at if we can truly confront our death, our mortality, our imminent demise, which is the consequence of all of this bad behavior, all of this egotism and separateness and disconnectedness. If we can break that cycle, if we can truly learn from history, if we can learn from our being, if and if we can truly and radically come together and change a, a better world than we can ever imagine is possible. So I'd, I'd like to, to bring it to Amanda to kind of close us out here with a, with a mother's love. I would just be echoing everything you and Alan have just said in Flower as well. Um, as usual, I want to state a call of action. I want to encourage people to do what I think is the top three things to help one wrap their head around these concepts that we discuss each time. And uh, the top one being, of course, becoming relevantly educated. We're here to help people be armed with the tangible knowledge they need to move forward confidently and actually make an impact. That's what Money Society um, is premised on, is being an informational hub that teaches people about sustainability and all of the, uh, the plethora of, uh, of arms of that. Um, so, so I encourage you uh, to perhaps look up some of the terms that we'll leave in the comments, some of the words and terms we've used today. Also seek community. You know, obviously, uh, individualism is toxic and one of the the major cornerstones in in the destruction of our society. So seek community, and and um, as hippie as it sounds, plant something. You know, uh, we were having an episode recently uh, talking about permaculture, and at this point in evolution, where we've become so incredibly detached from ourselves and ourselves as uh, as to say nature. That's that's what we are. We're all part of nature. Uh, just planting something and nurturing it will foster that connection to help you wrap your head back around who you are, where you came from, and what your purpose is here. Nature heals itself. That's what it does. It grows, it changes, and it adapts. And we are nature, and we need to grow and change and adapt. And we can, and we can help it, too. We can help that process along as well. But thanks, Amanda. Thank you for wonderful advice. Um, anybody else got any last, last thoughts before we uh, wrap it up? Do you have any closing thoughts, Matt? <laughs> no, I think I think this is honestly one of the one of the most important conversations that we could have. And uh, you know, this is this is the problem of our times and this is the obstacle to overcome. If there is one thing that we really need to educate ourselves on and make it a goal to change within our lives, it is this issue right here because it's not just affecting you, it's affecting your children, it's affecting every single life on this planet. And it will for generations to come. We're we're not just doing something that's going to last for a few years or a few decades. We're talking hundreds if not thousands of years that the effects from what we're doing right now are going to be lasting and and continue on and affecting our children and multiple generations to come so there's there's no there's no overblowing this subject there's no saying it's too important you know because it it literally is everything it encompasses everything else and this is honestly the majority of the reason why uh, you know, I do the work in, in, with this organization and everything is to try to educate people about the dire situation and then actually do something about it because I want my children to thrive and survive, you know, to thrive and uh, have a good life on this planet. And I feel like with the road that we're going down right now, that's just simply not going to happen. It's something that we desperately need to address and turn around. So that's that's me and my two cents. But um, anyway, thank you, Flower and Alan, for coming on, both of you, so much. It was a pleasure having you on. We hope to have you again in in the not-too-distant future. And um, 
I think it's a great episode. I think um, very educational. A lot of people, it's as um, you know, as scary as some of it sounds. It's a tough pill to swallow, but I think people need to hear it also. So, thank you for coming on and uh, sharing your wisdom. We appreciate it. We're so happy to have you here, Alan. This is such a great show. I, I wanted to get you on the show. You were one of the first people that I wanted. If I have one more little contentious call to action for anyone listening, it's to get, it's to find somebody in your life that you care about and get into the and get into it about this issue with them. Just get into it. Just dive deep in. Just jump into the deep end and talk about it. We 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 know that the rich are in bunkers talking about this, about how they can maintain their hegemony even after the world has ended. We need to have this conversation. That's what's going to tip the tide. Is all of us looking this in the eyes, looking at it, even if it feels too horrible, even if it feels too disgusting and despicable and dooming to look at. It is if we ignore it. If we ignore it, if we continue down this trajectory, it is inevitable and we will die. But if we don't, if we can we just look at the opportunity. That evolution, the keystone of, of evolution is mistakes, is, is mutation and fuck-ups. We have fucked up royally as a species, and out of that, we can build a better world than we've ever imagined. As the clock ticks, we are individually and collectively faced with the single most vital decision in the history of mankind. To crash and burn, or to change the course and literally save the world. Our belief in money is what brought us to where we are now, on the brink of cascading climate change. There's nothing stopping us from shifting our dedication to a sustainable way of life. Overcoming the hurdles of the necessary paradigm shift begins with having the right conversations. Keep this one going by subscribing, liking, and sharing, or by expanding your own dialogue to include environmental compassion and scientific data. The global and course-altering impact of this issue is of epic proportions. Pay attention. Tomorrow depends on it. <laughs>